Well, we're going to get right into the word. If you can turn your Bible to Proverbs 27.4. See, the book of Proverbs I read somewhere is called The Theology in Workman's Clothes. Okay, so the assignment tonight is to um, be able to take a look at what jealousy and envy look like in the biblical sense. So are we there? Proverbs 27, 4. It says, wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? Amen. Jealousy is that green monster, right? That formidable opponent within you. And you know what it does? It destroys friendships, excuse me, it destroys friendships, it divides churches, and it creates dissension. It dissolves families, but it is so insidious that we don't see it. It's a condition of the heart that we can be exercising it right now. You don't even have to move a muscle or speak a word and jealousy is right there at the door of the heart. Amen. It's a sin that you can experience just by looking at someone, right? By talking to them, by hearing of their accomplishments, by seeing what they have. You see, jealousy and envy are the two sides of the same coin. They kind of go hand in hand together. And it's been since the beginning of time. I mean, that's how... That's how Lucifer was kicked out of heaven. And misery loves company that he took a third of the angels with him, right? So in the New Testament, when Jesus was talking in Matthew 12, 34, you don't have to go there, but it is saying that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And you know, if you have jealousy, it's going to show in your words, in your actions, in your attitude, your behavior, and your character. You don't have to be saying anything, but your actions speak louder than what you could have ever said. Okay, you're not going to say I'm jealous of you, right? But in your heart, your heart, you're thinking it. And you know, the Bible tells us to pray for our enemies, right? And we're going to go there in a minute. Like, in the Bible also talks about loving your neighbor. Well, how can you love your neighbor when you can't even rejoice when they're blessed? Amen? So, and how can you pray for your enemy when you can't even love your friend? Amen? So if we can go to Isaiah 14, 12 through 20. I will indulge you with this scripture and I'm not gonna apologize for it because who knows, maybe this is about the only time that you'll you know, read a long scripture. But if we can go to Isaiah 14, 12, 20, this is how the um, devil, who, whom we know as Satan, was kicked out of, of heaven. I know it says that pride you know, was the root of it, but I think it started with jealousy, and then pride arose in his spirit. Amen. So how have you fallen from heaven, O light bringer and day star, son of the morning? You see, he was already good. He had a good place in heaven with God. And he had this marvelous voice, right, music, like when he opens his mouth, music came out. And he is in a good place, but he wasn't content with that. How you have been cut down to the ground, you who weakened and laid low the nations. O blasphemous satanic king of Babylon. And you said in your heart, I will. He said it in his heart. He didn't say it to Jesus, right, or to God. I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of assembly in the uttermost north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will, my, I will make myself 
like the Most High God. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, Hades, to the innermost recesses of the pit, the region of the dead. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? I mean, is this the man that caused me trouble? Who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities who would not permit his prisoners to return home? All the kings of the nations, all of them lie sleeping in glorious array, each one in his own sepulcher. But you are cast away from your tomb like a loathed growth or premature birth or an abominable branch of the family and like the raiment of the stain or slain. And you are clothed with a, is it stain? Those slain, those who trust through with the sword who go down to the stones of the pit into which carcasses are thrown like a dead body trodden underfoot. You shall not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land and have slain your people. May the descendants of evil doers never more be named. Because of his jealousy, look what happened to him. And he didn't go by himself, right? Misery loves company after all. And that's what happens when you are jealous of someone and you're praying. I mean, I'm sure that this has happened to us. You're praying, you're a committed, faithful, tither, believer, and you see a newbie Christian who comes in praying for everything that you wanted and they're getting blessed and you see them prosperous and blossoming and just flourishing. And here you are saying, oh my God, what is going on? What is wrong in this picture? Why are you blessing them and not me? Hold up. You are treading on dangerous ground because you are not having problems with that girl that has designer clothes or that guy that looks like Brad Pitt, you're not having those issues with those people who have, you know, all these things, all these blings, all these wonderful things that you might want. You're not having problems with them. You're having problems with God. You, it is an affront to God. You're saying, God, you are messing up here. You blew it. How could you not, how could you overlook me? How could you bless them and not me when I'm over here doing the works? You have to remember that everything you and I have is by grace and grace alone. It's by grace of God. He makes it rain to the righteous and the unrighteous. So you didn't get anything because of you. He gave it to you. So if you're questioning what you don't have, if you're not content with what you have, then you are having a problem with God. You are questioning his integrity. You are questioning his sovereignty. You're questioning his authority. You're questioning his domain of you, his lordship. I mean, just think about this. What is 70 in poverty when you have eternity? What is suffering here when you have, you're going to have a glorious body in heaven? What, what would you consider a mansion here on a hill? When you have, when you will have mansion in heaven. So why would you be jealous of things of people that have those things. See, envy, let's break it down a little bit. All right, envy is being upset or coveting something that you want but somebody has, which is why it's in the commandment, thou shall not covet, right? Because it's lusting after, it's in your heart. You want something so badly, what they have that you don't have. And jealousy could be, a couple of different pictures, it's just as bad, okay? Jealousy is like, you know, protecting something that you have, okay? In a marriage, that should be good. I mean, it shouldn't be okay to allow your wife to flirt with somebody else, right? Or vice versa. Jealousy here tends to be where you're protecting someone, but it's not okay for your spouse to not be able to speak, if it's a male, to another female, right, of the opposite sex without you getting an attitude or the other way around. 
That is unhealthy. Jealousy has caused division and it dissolved families because that is a destructive jealousy. Okay, so, you know, envying and jealousy, they are, they kind of go together. You're lusting after something that somebody else has that you don't have. Amen. So, you know, if we can rewind all the way back in, you know, what we did in Isaiah, but in Genesis 3, right? Genesis 3, that's where Adam and Eve, the beginning, in the beginning, in the Bible, in the beginning, they were, again, in a good place, perfect place in Eden. Why is it that they get tempted by this serpent, right? Because, because they had, you know, they, they, they were alone in the garden, and um, the serpent says, did you think that if you ate that fruit that you're really going to die? You know, planting that seed of deception, planting that seed of malice to question God. Kind of like what people do. Did you really think that's what pastor meant? Did he really do that service for the congregation? Or was that something else, right? You know, that kind of thing. That's what the serpent was doing, planting, you know, that seed of deception in Eve's ear. And Eve listened, right? And so the more she listened, the more the fruit looked appealing. It's like, so if I eat this fruit, I will not die. In fact, I will be like God. So she took a bite of it and gave it to her husband. And lo and behold, now we're falling creatures. So it started there. The jealousy was like, I want to be like God, but in a bad way. I mean, I know I want to be more like Jesus. I want to have more of him and less of me. But that's not the case over here. They wanted to be like God, the creative force, the power, the might, the glory, right? But God said, I will not share my glory with anyone. And so what do they do? You know, they partook of that fruit that was forbidden. One tree that they could have, right? See how lustful we are, how covetous we are? One tree that you couldn't have, and they disobeyed because there's that spirit of malice and jealousy, right? I want to be like God, so I'm going to go ahead and eat that. I'm not going to die. Yes, they died spiritually. They lost fellowship with God in the garden. They were banned from it. And then if we go down to Genesis 4, Abel and Cain, right? Again, it's a problem of jealousy, the two brothers gave an offering to God. One was accepted, Abel's offering, and the other was not, was rejected. Well, go figure. The other one was Cain, that was Cain, was so bitter, was so angry that his was rejected, and God warned him. He says, hey, you need to get a hold of yourself, your heart, because sin is crouching at your door, the door of his heart. He's harboring this anger, bitterness, and jealousy, but he didn't listen. So what happened? He had that murderous thinking, stinking thinking, that he actually took it into action, put it into action, and murdered his brother, right? So jealousy is not something that we want to have in our spirits but let's face it we have felt it we have dabbled with it we have experienced it and you are lying through your teeth if you say no right you've been with a girlfriend or a boyfriend and you felt jealous you felt that you know that feeling of like mm, right and you can't explain it and when they ask you what's wrong, nothing, right? <laughs> it's jealousy. But if not put in check, as Christians, we need to be able to converse, to communicate, to be able to be truthful, to mean what you say and say what you mean, starting with yourself. Amen? We have to be able to say, God, 
what is wrong with me? I have a problem with jealousy. Why am I jealous when you've blessed me so? You've given me so much. Why am I feeling jealous? You know, this is rampant in our society today, and you can't even tell because it's also in the church. Okay, this is how bad it is, and jealousy plunges us into turmoil. It is a sin that plunges us into turmoil. Amen. So if we can go to James 3.14. Hallelujah. James, he um, is talking about how bitter envy can be in your heart and it changes you into something that you weren't supposed to be. So 3.14. But if you have, I'm reading here from the King James. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. The wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, There is confusion and every evil work. So where there is envying and jealousy, there will be strife and every evil work. I don't know, maybe that's why it's stopping you from growing. It's stopping you from progressing. It's stopping you from advancing. It's stopping you from actually benefiting fully. Because you know what? If you have that spirit of jealousy and envy, you will not fulfill the mission that God has for you. You will not complete that mission that God has for you because it's stopping. Because instead of tasting the goodness of God, the goodness of the land, you are wetting your appetite about what others have that you don't have and you're envying and you're jealous about their accomplishments oh she looks better than i am in that dress oh she sings better than i do oh she writes so you know or speaks so eloquently oh she can you know she can just multitask so what god has given you gifts and abilities that are probably different from his or hers So you should embrace it and not be jealous about what God has given this other person. You know what? We should rejoice when people rejoice, when they're getting blessed. We should actually acknowledge it. Oh my God, you are so blessed. I'm so happy for you. Instead of acting like, oh, I didn't see a thing and walk away. That is so rude. Right? Oh, you got engaged. How beautiful is your ring? Oh, I, I've seen better. Or, you know, it's like, why is she getting engaged and I'm not? Why is she finding a husband and I don't? Why am I still single? I'm not talking about me, okay? I'm just saying that. <laughs> Let's get that straight. I'm just saying, you know, you could have been thinking that, <laughs> right? <laughs> So it's like, you know, it's like, oh, someone announced, you know, pregnancy, a a new arrival of a baby. You know, some people get, you know, jealous about that. That, oh, a new baby is on the way. Oh, a new promotion. Oh, a new house, a new car, a new toy. Why can't we just be happy and say congratulations? I'm really happy for you, Right. right? But instead, you know, we have this, resentment it's almost like you know don't rub it in my face you know check this out if you are praying for the very things that the people around you are receiving and you cannot rejoice with them what makes you think that you're qualified to receive the same blessings from God what makes you think that God will bless you when your heart is rotten about other people's blessings come on now this is something that we need to come out of because you need to address it 
especially if you're struggling with it. You can ask someone to pray with you and have an accountability partner and say, you know what, I am struggling with this. It's a spirit that's going to destroy you if not attended. You know, it, it goes to jealousy and envying and bitterness and resentment and pretty soon you're all alone. You've isolated yourself because you cannot stand the blessings that are being bestowed upon others. See, jealousy and envy, you know, they are the two sides of the same coin, okay? But let me just say something about a holy and righteous jealousy because our God is a jealous God. And his jealousy is justified. Don't say, well, if God can be jealous, I can be too. I already told you that the only righteous jealousy that you can have is to protect that marriage, right? That, that sanctity of marriage that you're not going to allow others to, like, kind of mess with it. All right? So, but God's jealousy is a holy jealousy. It's justified because it is meant to promote peace and restoration within ourselves, in our hearts, in our lives. He wants us to be devoted only to him. It's a commandment. He says, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. So he is saying, yes, for I am a jealous God. Let's go to Zechariah 8, 2. Amen. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I am jealous for her with great wrath against her enemies. He is a protective father. He is a jealous God, that's his name, but it is a righteous and holy jealousy. God knows that there is none like him, that no one can love you like he does. No one can protect you, can bless you, can heal you, provide for you like he does. So he wants you to be all for him, to him. And some people can say, well, he's a controlling God. Well, he is in control, right? He gave you life, so he is in control. He is Lord over you, should be, and you should be thankful, and you should accept that and not be jealous. Amen? See, when we put ourselves on the throne, when we put ourselves on the pedestal, when we put ourselves above God, that's when we get all messed up. Because really, if we put ourselves up on the throne, who else can you go to? Who can you pray to? Who can deliver you when you have taken the place of God? Amen? When you covet, you will not be able to celebrate when people celebrate their success or victory. And when, again, when, I, when you know that you struggle with that, you need to expose it. You say, God, expose me to me. Okay, as you reveal yourself to me, expose me. And you know, it doesn't feel good, right? It doesn't feel good when God shows you things that you have to deal with. It doesn't feel good, but you know what? When I see that, it's like I feel bad and sad and glad all at the same time. Call me crazy, but you know, those are the feelings that I feel because I feel sad that I've done something like that and I feel bad that I hurt someone. And I'm also glad that, God, I have an antidote. I have an answer to this problem. I can change in your help, with your help. I can be that person that you've called me to, to be and not, not be this jealous and envious person. Now, you know, we have a lot of examples in the Bible you know, that dealt with jealousy, like King Saul, right? In, in, um, in the battle when, um, you know, they were parading, coming back from the battle. You know, the people were shouting, King Saul, you know, it was great. He kills a th- his thousand, right? And, you know, he was like, yeah, right? <laughs> he was walking, he was strutting. And then when David, when it was David's float, you know, 
they were saying, they were chanting, here comes David, he killed his 10,000. And boy, did his head turn. And his, he, he, there was a rain on his parade because, you know, he heard 10,000s on David. So immediately he felt jealous. And from then on, he wanted to kill David, his most loyal general, right? And you wouldn't say, oh my gosh, yeah, that's great. I have a great loyal general you know, soldier on my side, you know, who can kill 10,000s? It's like, but his heart was not right. He was full of jealousy and resentment that the person that was loyal to him, the person that loved him, the person that comforted him, he wanted to kill. What's wrong with that picture? It's a spirit that was engulfing him, that was sabotaging him, and he allowed it. Amen. You know, Joseph, right, the one with uh, the coat of many colors, he, he was the brother that the brothers detested They because, you know, it was not a secret that he was like the favorite because he was the youngest at the time, or he was the youngest. Um, and um, Rachel's baby, so, you know, Jacob loved him. And... Whenever he opened his mouth, you know, the brothers just resented him even more because he was prophesying, and they didn't like him for being somewhat, you know, cocky and arrogant. But, you know, despite all that, I mean, they were driven to practically killing him, but someone said, no, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him to um, slavery, to Egypt, right? Or just slavery. And it happened, but uh, the point is, even with your loved ones, your family members, if you're so wrapped up in your jealousy that you can't see straight, it blinds your reasoning that you cannot even think properly anymore because you're just so caught up in that emotion, that passion that is wrong. It's evil. Amen? Now let's turn to Luke 15, 11, 32. Another long story. It's a parable. I love this story. Well, I love the stories in the Bible, but especially the ones that I really know, famous, right? The tale of two brothers, all right? So this is, are we there? Luke 15. We're going to read it, and I'll stop and go and just kind of um, interject what what is in this story and he said there was a certain man who had two sons you know two brothers and the younger of them said to his father father give me the part of the property that falls to me and he divided the estate between them now this is while the father is still alive and customary you know you don't give the inheritance while the father is still alive right and not many days after that the son Younger son gathered up all that he had and journeyed into a distant country. And there he wasted his fortune in reckless and loose from restraint living. And when he had spent all he had, a mighty famine came upon that country, and he began to fall behind and be in want. So he went and forced himself upon one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed hogs. This is how bad he got. He was actually living with pigs and fighting with them for food, right? And he would have gladly have fed on and filled his belly with the carob pods that the hogs were eating. But they could not satisfy his hunger, and nobody gave him anything better. It's not even enough, okay, for the pigs and him. Then when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father have enough food? And even food to spare, but I am perishing or dying here of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and came to his own father, but while he was still a long way off, See, this is how parents are, you know, when we're waiting and expecting for our children to return home. They're far off, and you, you know without a shadow of a doubt that that's him. It's my son coming home. 
His father saw him and was moved with pity and tenderness for him. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him fervently. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Whatever he recited in his mind, he's saying now, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I no longer deserve to be recognized as a son of yours. But the father said to his bond servants, bring quickly the best robe, the festive robe of honor, and put it on him. See, it doesn't matter where he's been, what he's done. The father was receiving him. And give him a ring for his hand and sandals for his feet. And bring out that wheat fattened calf and kill it. And let us revel and feast and be happy and make merry. Okay. Because this my son was dead and is alive, again he was lost and is found. And they began to revel and feast and make merry. But his older son was in the field, and as he returned and came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. And having called one of the servant boys to him, he began to ask what this meant. He was like, what is going on? He didn't even ask the father, right? He asked the servant boy, do you know how we do it? We're not going to go to the source. We're like, what's all this about? <laughs> Gossiping, right? Because you're jealous already. Wh where do they go? How, where do they go? Do they, do they go out to eat? They didn't invite me. <laughs> invite yourself. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed that wheat, fat, and calf because he has received him back safe and well. Here he goes. But the elder brother was angry with deep-seated wrath and resolved not to go in. Then his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Look, with an attitude, with that indignation, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your command. Here it goes, the litany of things that I did for you. Yet you never gave me so much as a little kid that I might revel and feast and be happy and make merry with my friends. You didn't throw a slumber party for me, Dad. You didn't even, you know, you didn't even throw a party for me, not even a little birthday party. But when this son of yours arrived who has devoured your estate with immoral women, I mean, now he's telling He's even like dragging this brother that has returned home and received grace and mercy back to the mud. We do that. You know, we, we don't want to forget if it's someone else. But if it's us, we want mercy, right? You have killed for him that wheat, fat, and calf. And the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours, but it was fitting to make merry, to revel and feast and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. Are you like the older brother in that sense? As far as not being able to rejoice with that extension of grace and mercy to someone? That was just an illustration of another kind of deep-seated jealousy, that deep-seated, filled with envy and bitterness. I mean, he should have been saying, yay, that's, that's great, Junior is back. Welcome home, brother. Bruh, right? <laughs> Where have you been? You know, it's good to see you. It's great to see you. I would have dropped everything and ran to him too. Haven't seen you in a long time. But that's not what he did. He was bitter. He was jealous that the father did all that for the younger brother. And that's kind of how we are. You know, maybe not in that degree. It's in different varying, you know, levels of jealousy. But nonetheless, it's still bad. Okay? You can sugarcoat it. You can paint it. But it comes out eventually. And, you know, it's going to suck the life out of you. You can try to pretend and cover it up and say, you know, I'm good, I'm okay, I'm dealing with it. But until you confess it to God, until you say, God, I have this problem. I really have this struggle in me. 
I need your Holy Spirit to expose it even more so that when I feel it arising, I can pray and say, nope, I'm casting it down, and I am not going to succumb to it. I am not going to entertain it. I'm not going to partake. I'm not going to be involved in it. I am casting it down because it's not of you. I am content with what you've given me. I am blessed. I am good. I am, I, I am thankful. See, when you are grateful to God, you don't really have time to get jealous because you are so focused on what he has done for you and what he's doing for you and within you. You are not going to go and, and look at, you know. See, we cannot be a church, all right, full of love when we and that can put our act into practice when we're so busy looking at our brother's garage and see what's in there, okay? We cannot put our love into practice when we are so full of jealousy that we are worried about the numbers. I know we don't have that problem here at El Shaddai, but, you know, who did you bring? How many people are attending your church? You know, how many people attended your Bible study? I mean, Who cares? We are here to deliver the good news, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not to compete with one another. You know, this is about ministry, and ministry is about serving. And you cannot be a jealous person if you're serving in the ministry. You cannot, and you cannot serve if you're jealous. You cannot serve effectively, at least. Because you're always going to try to be finding that position A position, and I'm talking about a position, a title. See, you're not supposed to seek a position. You have been placed here. You should be fine where God placed you because God knows what he's doing. He placed you where he placed you. And before he gives you what you're asking for, he wants to test your character. Can you handle it? Are you going to be that person that I've called you to be to give you the blessings that you are asking Can you handle it? Can your character handle it? Not with that kind of spirit of jealousy or envying. Amen. You are not going to, and if that's what you're asking, if you're looking around and saying, God, everything that I've asked for, you've given to her or him, right? You know, it's like, why is that? Well, you know what? That is the wrong question, okay? The question should be, God, What can I do to get closer to you? What can I do to better serve you or your people? You've called me in a place where I can grow. I want to grow. And not to look for works, all right? I'll tell you, that's something that I um, am so blessed and so thankful that I didn't know anything about when I first got saved. I had no idea about works, you know, works and all of the other stuff, you know, the big word fellowship. I learned that as I, you know, was going along the way, as I was growing, and it was, it happened naturally. I didn't force anything, you know. In fact, I, I, you know, I'm like the type of person that doesn't volunteer. (laughs) I don't volunteer. Now you know my secret. I don't volunteer, but when I was asked, you know, like to come out of myself, to come out of the box, like to, to come out of just of not volunteering. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't said like that, but in a, in a sermon, you know, that it's like, okay, come out of myself, meaning, you know, to be real when I talk to people, to be engaged and to actually know their name to actually listen, you know, that was a big thing to me, to talk to people and not just pass by them, ignore them, you know, or or act like you didn't see them. Some of us do that, okay? And some of them are sitting here, unfortunately. And, you know, and if, if there is a problem of jealousy or envying, get rid of it. We need a church that is united in the spirit and should be rejoicing when someone is rejoicing. You know how you can tell the spirit of jealousy is present on a person? 
is it's, it's been said that they, it's easy to show sympathy and weeping when they're weeping, but they can't rejoice when you're rejoicing. That shows that spirit of jealousy when they can't even compliment you when you look good. You know, they can't even compliment that, oh, you look great or that whatever shade looks really becoming on you. You know, they can't even say that. It's, it's amazing how, you know, I, I, I don't do flattery well, but when I compliment, it's for real. It's like I did not just make it up to make you feel good. I'm saying it because I like what I'm seeing. I'm like, <laughs> and I'm actually complimenting you because I think it looks nice, right? Let's go to Proverbs 14.30. Amen. Solomon says a lot about jealousy. And um, he says in this version, I don't know if it's the same. That one, it says, a calm and undisturbed mind and heart are the life and health of the body. But envy, jealousy, and wrath are like rottenness of the bones. Amen. Amen. Over here, I I wrote down, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Jealousy is cancer to the bones, you know that? It destroys the body, not just the body of Christ, but your body. Talking about your physical body. Okay, it starts out as like a benign tumor, but left unchecked, it can grow into a malignant cancer okay, and can kill you. And if you're full of jealousy and envy, right, again, you are not going to be fit for the master's use because you are questioning God again, and he will answer you, which, in fact, he has, if we can go to Romans. Amen. Where is that scripture? Nine. Romans 9, 20. Because it is like an insult to God. It's an affront to God, demanding answers as to why you made you, he made you a certain way. Why he didn't make you look like, you know, uh, I can't think of a Victoria's Secret model. Or you can't play like Steph Curry or Michael Jordan. I mean, you know, jealous or envious of their their, again, their gifts and talents and abilities. Why you can't play, you know, drums like Brother Rick or a guitar like Brother, you know, Brother Bob. It's, it's coveting what others have. So your jealousy is an affront to God. You're pointing at him saying, you blew it, God. Okay. And God responds and says, but who are you? A mere man to criticize and contradict and answer back to God. Will that, what is formed, say to him that formed it, why have you made me thus? Why did you make me look like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same mass one vessel for beauty and distinction and honorable use and another for menial or ignoble and dishonorable use? Are you going to question God when he will tell you Well, I made you. I am the potter. You are the clay. You be still. You be quiet and be thankful that I give you breath of life every day, that I provide for you, that I give you grace, undying love, that I am your everlasting source, not just here, but after. And you're going to question me? Why I made you look like that, right? I mean, it, it's really about the condition. It's an in, insidious sin. You can't see it. You can't detect it. But after a while, it comes out. Again, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Jealousy deepens your suspicion of others, okay? Jealousy, every time they say something, what do you mean by that, right? Right? Or every time they get a phone call, who's that? Who are you talking to? What do they say? 
Jealousy diminishes your appetite for God's word. It diminishes. You can pretend that you're quoting scriptures. You can pretend that. But it really diminishes your appetite for the word of God because you don't feel good about yourself. So in order for us to taste the goodness of God, we need to look introspectively and say, God, if there is a jealous inch of me, cut it out. Amen.